I got lost straight away. No, welcome everybody to, to the session, uh, which is uh, SecOps 2021 today. So there's a pause in there for dramatic effect, right? Uh, the purpose of the mentioning, you know, something in the future, something that is forward looking, is that um, if we go back two years ago, the, when Lambda was initially released, the use of things like Lambda to automate event response was uh, very novel and uh, very few customers started using it even in the first 12 months for purely the perspective of supporting operational security tasks. Uh, right now, something that at that time seemed to be you know, very forward looking and very slightly far-fetched, uh, it's becoming real, you know. People are automating more and more the way in which they perform their security operations on AWS, relying on a number of technologies that we'll cover. Uh, I am uh, very glad to have with me uh, Alex Mestrete from Netflix. Uh, you will come and join us uh, a bit later on to talk a bit more about how Netflix approaches some of the topics that we are covering within the SecOps space. One thing that I guess it's, uh, it's good to set a scene for is that um, why 2021, right? Why not 2020 or 2025 or something like that? Uh, I'm a big fan of William Gibson. And he wrote a story called Johnny Mnemonic. Johnny Mnemonic takes place in 2021. Uh, ends up if you watch the movie or read the short story. Good on you. In Johnny Mnemonic, the whole story is about data transfer, you know. He's picking up a large volume of data back in 1993, I think, which is 320 gigabytes, and he's transferring it between one continent to the other. Uh, and there's all kinds of, uh, you know, threat actors that are at play that want to get hold of that data. There's uh, uh, some insight into the use of encryption and secrets to protect the data. So it's quite a cool movie. But essentially, and he, as you could expect from a, from, a, from, a, from a movie, from a Hollywood blockbuster, so to speak, uh, there's all kinds of twists uh, uh, in the story. So that helped define, in a way, or it is the ruse for the for the agenda that we have, which is um, we will start by looking uh, from the perspective of protecting assets and how we can automate that and how we can create um, full end-to-end -end workflows that take things from the implementation of a control to monitoring its effectiveness to automatically fixing it or preventing it uh, from, uh, from becoming you know, an actual anomaly, like stop the bleeding type actions. We will then very quickly move to adapt and what we mean by adapt is um, situations in where, you know, the environments in which we operate are not static, right? Uh, so depending on the data that is being received and in general on situational awareness, how can security controls tune up so that they respond to their environment rather than just being you know, a static binary, yes, no, or a very simplistic heuristic. And sometimes, you know, things may go south and we need to respond to it. And that's all that we'll cover on the third topic. So let me start with the, with the first one and go straight into protect. And to get us going, we will have a very simple use case. We have a user, he needs to launch a new instance. To do that, he's going to make an API call, right, which is calling run instances. And uh, with uh, run instances, it will specify a number of things, as you'll know, like uh, you know, security groups, what is the base AMI placement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The use case or the main requirement from, uh, from um, a security perspective is that only an approved AMI is used and that AMI is placed in the, you know, as the right placement and a few things around, around it are also adequate. So let me switch to another laptop and let's just go straight through that, that set of actions. So I'm going here, I am that user, I just want to launch an AMI. So I'll just pick the first one from that list, which is Amazon Linux, right? Uh, I'll say, uh, I'll go back slightly. I'll say that I want to place it on a specific subnet because that's the one where I know I want to perform you know, what I need to do, which in this case is the front end for, a, for an application. And after doing that, uh, I will just go straight to it. I just want to do a quick test. So let me just press a launch and see what happens there. 
we can acknowledge that. So I press launch. This will be all behavior that uh, I, you likely will be very familiar with. Uh, the first state that an instance goes to when you launch it is the instance of is, is, is pending. Pending means that there's a few things being done in the background to prepare that, uh, you know, convert an AMI and make an instance out of it, right? We give it a few seconds. We're going to press refresh. And we see that it is shutting down. Typically, the state now would be, you know, it takes a bit longer than it took right here, but it would go into running. And it is shutting down because, you know, I just picked a random AMI. It's not authorized or anything like that. It's just, you know, an AMI straight off the marketplace. That is somewhat interesting, to be honest. Better ways of doing it with IAM and access uh, uh, and policies to, to block. So let's do it slightly different. Let's this time I'm going to launch an AMI and I'm going to use the correct one that I know needs to be used. I'm going to place it in the same subnet. Sorry, in the same VPC and subnet. And we are good, we are good, we are good, we are good, and we are good. We acknowledge that, we press launch instances, and um, this thing starts cranking away. This thing is called the cloud, by the way. Uh, it goes, once again, into pending, so we've been here before, and it goes again into shutting down. So there is a slight difference to the previous one, right? This time, what I did was I used actually what is supposed to be an approved AMI. Uh, I did place it in the front, in the, main, in the, in the subnet that is the front end. Uh, it saw me that then I just clicked through very quickly. Uh, and what happens in the console when you click very quickly through the security groups? It will create one for you, you know, like launch wizard dash something, which uh, in this case defaults to having uh, SSH open to the world. So what happened, what is happening at the back is a number of things. And uh, let's, let's go in a, in a bit of detail into that. So. Is enough. It's launching initial. It's, 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 there's not much to it. But what I'm doing is that I am capturing, or I have set up a filter that if a specific API call or uh, if a specific instance state is entered, in this case pending, I want to analyze in more detail what are the circumstances under which that uh, instance is being launched. So I have a filter that says something comes to pending, please trigger a lambda. And the only purpose of this lambda is to evaluate uh, the context of that instance, right? Where is it coming from? Uh, where it is being placed? So is it in the right subnet? Not just the VPC is not enough in this case. Uh, and does it have adequate uh, security groups? So far, a fairly common use case, I would say. So some of you may already be doing many things familiar to this. The traditional path here would be, is it okay after assessing those three elements? And if it's not okay, you know, just terminate the instance as you are showing. We are not doing that. What we are doing here is actually, is actually generating a new CloudWatch event. This time it is a custom one, so it is not relying on any event that is generated by the AWS platform, but one that is generated by my code that says, I made an assessment and I need to escalate this to another level of, uh, of, uh, of assessment or response in this case, that will lead to the termination of that instance. That is the action that uh, I decide to, to take when I come across uh, this, uh, this uh, kind of setup. So one final lambda is called. So this very simple example, what it is doing or what it is showcasing is a couple of things. First is, CloudWatch events and those uh, couple of JSONs that I had there, uh, we are using CloudWatch events to route or route messages between the different lambdas and uh, to vary our response based on small sets of heuristics. The second one is that you know, Lambda, you know, it's, it's, it thrives in, uh, in, uh, in uh, being event-driven and uh, when some data is checked at it to you know, evaluate and do something with it. So that place, not, not so much new. But as often happens in demo, I did cheat things a bit. So if I show you the code for it, for uh, 
the first lambda that I had there. Uh, you will see that, uh, and all the code, by the way, I have a link at the end, will all be provided to, to you all. What in there it is saying, essentially, you know, calling a method in Python, it is defining a custom event that you see here, uh, which is escalating to something called the, the outer responder level two active response, and we know that the action is terminated. But where I say that things are a bit too much demo-like in these circumstances is that um, if you look here, you will see that uh, I have the main evaluation parameters, they are hard-coded, right? It says, you know, this needs to be this AMI, uh, and if it is this AMI, it should go in one of these subnets, and if it is in one of these subnets, it essentially will need to use one of these uh, security groups. So it is, it is effective, but obviously environments are, are dynamic, right? You cannot be expecting to be releasing code uh, every time you create a new security group or something like that. Let me go back to the slides. So context in this case was art coded. And uh, context is, is not everything, but it is a lot when uh, analyzing log information and event information for security purposes. I often show this slide during the, the current year to showcase uh, what is the spectrum of, uh, of uh, options available to respond to an event, right? If you start on the lower left, essentially you are aggregating data but not doing much straight away with it. It is still valuable, right? When you are collating from a security perspective, it is valuable for things like forensics, for example. Look back, see what happened before. Or to generate aggregate measures for measuring performance, MI information, et cetera. But it starts, become, it starts becoming really useful when you start uh, enriching it. Because when you are enriching it, that's when you are adding context. That's when you are making things relevant to you. If you are simply going to alert on any time an instance is launched, it's going to become very noisy, right? Probably the, the false positive rate is going to be quite high and very quickly will start to be ignored. So as much context as we get around uh, an event that is generic and generated by either the platform or by syslog or by you know, any other kind of log source, the more context that you can add to it, the better your response can be. And I'd say that there are a couple of, uh, of, uh, of um, main types of context that you can add. One of them, which is static, that's the example I went through, although it was art coded. Uh, and the other one is situational, so it's more, more, more varied. It, flies, it, uh, it uh, depends on a set of circumstances rather than a set of data that I have stored in some form, be it hard-coded or in a store like DynamoDB. I mentioned DynamoDB because that is a very common uh, service that uh, we use to, to store that additional metadata with which we enrich events. So the code that I'm showing you on, on screen, it's, uh, it's code that is actually being used in, uh, in, uh, with some of our customers. Uh, and what you see in there is something that by now you should be, if you've not used it before, a bit familiar. But essentially what it is doing is creating a custom CloudWatch event. Um, a custom CloudWatch event uh, that uh, in this case is saying you know, you're going to need to alert. But more interesting is, uh, is that one, which is essentially what, uh, what uh, these two snippets do is as soon as you get an event, in this case it could be a cloud trail, cloud trail or CloudWatch, uh, what is the first thing that it does is to enrich it, meaning that it will add original data to a native cloud uh, event. In this case, the data that we were adding was uh, information about, let me just backtrack for a second, but um, you know, if you get a security event, obviously that needs a response to. One thing that is really good is make sure that it gets as quickly as possible to a person that can evaluate it and take action to deal with it. So what you are seeing on screen, what it does and what the store keeps is a list of account IDs uh, a list of internal owners uh, from a security, from a more general governance perspective, uh, and maybe a couple of secondary contacts. And also information about the purpose of the account and its data classification. Uh, if I have someone launching an EC2 instance, let's say, and it's in my sandbox account, 
probably I don't worry too much about it, right? It's, it's supposed to be happening. Uh, if I have someone doing it in an environment that I know that remains fairly static, and that instance is being launched manually by a user that I haven't seen logging on to Datagon for a while, that is, you know, higher signal, slightly lower noise, it is worth of investigating. The end-to-end -end description of that enrichment is, uh, is shown in that diagram. Um, so, in this case, what we are doing um, is enriching data that comes from CloudTrail. So, you have a set of accounts. Those accounts are all set up to aggregate CloudTrail logs in, the, uh, in a centralized bucket. And uh, as it gets to that cloud, uh, as a new file or a, a new set of logs get deposited in that bucket, you know, it triggers a notification that we launch a series of lambdas uh, and those lambdas have some uh, hard, co hard code, not hard code, but they have a set of heuristics that will evaluate that uh, event that just came in, as described there. Now, the one at the bottom, that's where it becomes more interesting, right? Because each of those lambdas is also making a request to Dynamo or caching data from Dynamo that allows it to enrich the, the, the event. And the final decision is made, actually just before step six, you know, there's a couple of things that happen in there. Uh, in step six, the couple of things that happen is it gets a new event, which is via CloudWatch events, a custom one. Uh, that event goes to a master assessor that determines, is it taking place in an account that I really care about? And if so, I need to escalate it. For the purpose of uh, the demo that I'll do, it will be email, but obviously there's, you know, better ways to do it if you're doing it in the real world, like integration with your SIM or your ticketing system. And the other one that I'd say that is quite important is uh, to, even if it is deemed to be an alert that is um, not that sensitive, uh, to still uh, store it, right? It could be that something that happens today that uh, I may say that it doesn't, you know, it's not that important, I don't need to pay immediate attention to it. But, you know, when looking back, it could be that forensically it could be actually useful and represent uh, a piece of a wider puzzle. And this brings me to the second part uh, of, um, of uh, the talk today, which is uh, about ADAPT. Sometimes you can take a joke too far, right? Anyone familiar with that one? That's Predator, right? And, uh, and one thing that he had was, um, if you remember from that movie, is um, you'd adapt to its environment when required, go stealth, and when it was the time to pounce, so to speak, you'd do so. The case that uh, we will walk through next is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is about precisely that. It's about how you can establish situational awareness about something that is happening within the platform, how you can adjust your security posture to respond, and, and if necessary, you know, be stealthy about it. It could be that there are events happening that warrant more, uh, uh, you know, being more watchful, but don't necessarily uh, dictate that you need to intervene directly, right? So, our case is fairly straightforward. Someone needs to SSH into an instance. It still happens sometimes. Someone needs to SSH to an instance, right? Our default operating mode is that uh, we are, you know, have a number of uh, logging sources enabled, uh, namely syslog, which is being collated or aggregated in CloudWatch logs. We have flow logs, which is also going to CloudWatch logs. It goes by default, right? And we also have CloudTrail enabled. The reason why I mentioned these three is that this gives us visibility at three levels, right? At the network level, the operating system with syslog, and also at the platform with CloudTrail. Now, under normal operation, this is what uh, you know, a user would do. Let me switch window here and minimize that one. Right? I would go, I would, uh, let's go with the first one. 
And don't worry too much about the get log on ticket. Essentially what that is, is just uh, you know, simulating a ticketing system that uh, you know, grants and is then expecting that I log on to the instance. So I get the ticket, I have my SSH key and uh, I log on to my instance. It's going to ask me yes, I say yes. And I am in, right? So not much there. But what happened in the back uh, was quite a few things. And I gave one arrow away. As soon as I logged on to that instance, the instance itself triggered a custom CloudWatch event. As we know, custom CloudWatch events will lead to triggering of uh, a Lambda. In this case, what the Lambda is doing is checking if there is a ticket associated with that logon. It says, hey, is this logon all right? Actually, it's checking against the canary that is in DynamoDB. And if it comes back saying that, yeah, it's good, you're good to go, you know, not much happens. So what I described to you so far, you really need to take my word, right? It's on trust. But let's say that, you know, the user does what he needs to do. And uh, something went wrong in this process now. Maybe someone was able to get hold of that credential that I just used. Or it could be that it is myself that I remembered after logging out, or I have something else I need to do, so let me go back quickly. So I go back in, this time a bit quicker. I do an LS and a couple other things. And uh, the big difference that has happened right now is that um, I did not follow that process that was supposed to be in place, right? Which is to have um, a ticket requested that will allow me to get access to the instance. So I, I, I deviated from what is expected. As I deviate, we will have a slightly different response. Very quickly. Right? So let me walk you through what happens there. I log on again. I have a custom CloudWatch event that uh, just requested. Uh, sent to the, to, the, to the Lambda that in turn goes to DynamoDB and asks, is this logon okay, yes or no? This time, the answer is going to be that no, it is not okay. Being not okay means that a few things uh, happen there. Uh, can you read that? I'll zoom in just in case. Uh, maybe I shouldn't zoom in, right? There we go. So, you see here that, you know, as I didn't raise a ticket, something is telling me, hey, there's been a log on, uh, and we are not able to track that to, to an authorized uh, action. Secondly, it is saying, I'm going to be more watchful from now onwards. I'm going to start subscribing new sets of lambdas and using CloudWatch events to subscribe to a series of log files so that I can you know, continue to evaluate exactly what's going on here. And you see that there is a subscription to Varlog Secure and another one to Flow Logs to get the visibility at the network level. If, by the way, the emails that you see before were related to the first demo, right? Which is AMI didn't match, et cetera, et cetera. So, here's what went on. We just said log on is not okay. If it's not okay, I need to do something. And the thing that I'm doing is um, I raise a new custom CloudWatch event. That's a theme for the day. That says I want to enhance my posture. I want to be more watchful about what's going on. And that additional watchfulness is, uh, is doing a number of things, but two of them are to do with uh, setting up a new series of lambdas that are subscribing to syslog or varlog secure. And, uh, a second set that is looking into what's happening on the network. And 
in addition, besides looking at flow logs more at a VPC network level, it also set up a set of flow logs that are uh, just associated with the interfaces for that instance and also add subscribers to it so that it can, you know, just get a direct feed that only contains data for the instance that I'm interested in. <coughs> now, for now, everything or the only thing that is happening is that, you know, Someone is here. Uh, we see from the email notifications that I showed you that a few things happen in the background, but uh, nothing has dictated that, uh, that uh, I be more uh, direct or more active in my response. So let me do something. Let's say that now I escalate the level of privileges that I have. Remaining, uh, you know, being a regular user logging on to an instance is, um, I may be able to tolerate and assess to see if it is just a mistake or if it is something else. Escalating my privilege to become the owner of that machine, to becoming a privileged user, to becoming root, that is something more concerning. And uh, you may hear my keyboard, but essentially, right now, I'm unable to interact with the instance because there's been something that said, until now, I was willing to just watch. But now that you are root, actually I need to do something about it and we need to deal with it. Which also gave us a few seconds to get a couple of emails. A couple of emails, what they are saying is essentially, hey, there's been a root escalation. We're not going to be anymore just watching. We are going to do something about it, which in this case is about isolating that instance. Uh, t -t 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 and you see the set of steps that were taken all the way at the bottom. So API termination enabled so that we can preserve the instance. It is not accidentally shut down because we want to use it for forensic purposes. Uh, we change the security group. We don't want that instance anymore to be playing an active role in serving actual production traffic. And a few more things have, uh, have happened there. Let me switch back to, to my slides. Right? So... Quick rerun. We came to the conclusion that you know, it is a series event, right? It is a series event, so the actions that I am going to take is first, I want to isolate the instance. There's a lambda that did just that. Second, uh, I want to deregister that instance from uh, you know, ELBs and uh, uh, auto scaling groups and such so that it no longer serves any kind of business purpose. You know, we, we see it as being tainted at this point, potentially compromised. It's a belt and braces approaches in there, right? In one hand, we are blocking traffic. In the second, on the other hand, we are also deregistering it from uh, load balancers and so on. And lastly, I want to find out exactly what happened there. So I am uh, in the background. This is also triggering snapshotting of all the volumes associated with that instance so that we can facilitate, you know, a bit the life of the forensic investigators. Autoscaling at the same time realizes that, you know, my cluster or my fleet is one host down. Let me launch a new one from uh, what we at this stage assume to be known good. And, you know, everything is, uh, is back to normal. Now, this is not the end of it, right? It is actually the start. Uh, and uh, I play a, a couple of shaky jokes with movies, right? But uh, my, my, my guest also very much involved with the cinematic industry and all the streaming, etc. But uh, they do it for real life. So I'd like to hand over to Alex Mistretti from, uh, from uh, Netflix. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. So uh, we talked a little bit about prevention, talked a little bit about detection. And I'm going to carry that forward and talk about response, which is a topic near and dear to my heart. My name is Alex Mistretti, and I run the Netflix security intelligence and response team. So our team provides security intelligence, uh, as well as crisis management and incident response across Netflix. Um, and the way that we approach security, I don't know if some of you saw the keynote yesterday, actually, it was interesting to hear the way Amazon approaches it. Um, you know, no SOC, no sort of traditional models. We, we have a similar approach, and that, that approach is really an extension of the Netflix culture and our tech stack. So as far as our culture, uh, you may have seen the famous Netflix culture deck, and we've actually revamped that into a culture memo. Uh, it's, you know, shameless plug, jobs.netflix.com slash culture. I'll give you a minute to type that into your phones. Uh, you can go review this. And basically, this document codifies our belief that you can scale an organization while maintaining an incredibly high talent density. 
And this is a lot of work, but the payoff, the return on that investment, is that you don't then need a lot of uh, prescriptive procedures or policies uh, or controls in place. So you don't need to define what a vacation policy is. You don't need to define what an expense account looks like. You trust your employees to go ahead and, and act in the interest of the best, the best interest of the company. And that extends to the way we approach security. So it's not a traditional model. We, we give a lot of power and authority to our individual contributors, to our engineers, to do what's right. Um, to take smart bets on behalf of the company, but then you need a good response function there to, to pick up the pieces when those smart bets don't pay off. So that's the first part, the culture. The second part is our tech stack. Um, there are a ton of great talks happening at reInvent right now about how Netflix engineers are our streaming service. A lot of the business logic of our streaming service exists in AWS. So I encourage you to check those out. Um, again, our, our Medium tech blog has a list of those. I've pinned a, a list of the other talks to my Twitter account, my, my last name at Twitter. Uh, so I encourage you to check those out, but in sort of broad strokes as far as security response is concerned, uh, I think about three main characteristics of our tech stack uh, in AWS. One, microservices, two, roughly immutable instances, and three, ephemeral instances. So microservices, that means that we've decomposed this large application into microservices that do one particular thing really well. So compare that to a traditional server where it might, I think about the first you know, Unix server that my friends helped administer in my high school, it was, you know, it was the mail server, it had home user home directories, it had interactive shell, it had the web server, it had all of the things, right? And then we had the NT server that was a domain controller. It was also the nicest machine we had with the best internet connection, so we surfed the web on it. So if you're doing these, all these different activities on a server, it can be very hard to determine what is legitimate activity, what is sort of gray activity, and what is dangerous activity. But not so with microservices. With those, you have a very defined task for each server, and that allows you to do um, forensics much more easily. The second thing that helps is, is immutable instances. And we're not completely there, but the idea behind an immutable instance is that you deploy this instance from source. Um, in our case, we bake AMIs, and then those AMIs then become instances. Uh, if you've heard about Docker and containers, it's a similar model, right? You create a container, and then you deploy that container. Uh, and once it's deployed, you should not be doing any configuration on that anymore. Uh, there should be no interactive logins, no chef, no puppet, no changes to that in production. If you want to make a change, you make a change to source, and you redeploy. So again, from a forensics perspective, that gives you a very strong baseline. That AMI, that gold image, is sort of known good if you trust your build pipeline. Uh, and you can do a differential analysis on that versus your target, and that pops out right away what the changes are that are relevant to look at. So that's the immutable aspect. The ephemeral aspect is the last bit, and that means that these instances don't last very long. So you sort of saw there with the auto-scaling group, right? You can deploy from this AMI, deploy these instances. They scale up to handle traffic. They scale down when traffic's missing. If you heard about our chaos program, we sort of summarily execute these instances at various times to test resiliency. So if these instances don't live very long, they don't deviate too much from the baseline, and if um, the whole system is resilient to their failure, then as a response team, you can be very aggressive in your response actions. Um, you know, in more traditional models, you've probably run into that, that sacred cow server with eight years of uptime. Um, you know, the admins are very proud of that figure, but you can't touch it, right? If you knock it over, every minute of downtime costs you your annual salary kind of thing. So with these ephemeral instances, that's not the case. You can be very rough with them. You can take them out of circulation. As, as we saw there, you can quarantine them for later looks. So it's a, a, it's a fun place to do response. You can be much more aggressive in the way that you pursue it. So a bit of, of an aside there on, on our approach to security. Um, today we'll talk about forensics, and essentially we're going to talk about good old-fashioned Linux forensics with an AWS twist. There's a whole other layer, actually, that's very interesting uh, working in AWS, and that's you know, the Cloud Trailer Cloud Watch we heard a bit about previously. And uh, I would just like to plug the security jam that's happening right now in the, in the park, in the jam tent. We've got uh, Netflix uh, created a three-stage capture the flag where you guys can actually get some hands-on sort of attack defense using the AWS layer. But for today, traditional Linux, um, looking at how we can do basically dead box forensics and live response uh, at a scalable manner. So we'll advance. So before we jump into that exactly, we'll talk a little bit about the, the setup that you need ahead of time. So you need to set up your roles and accounts, your IAM privileges to enable you to conduct your mission. Uh, in our case, we run a multi-account setup, and I think a lot of folks will be going this direction. So you could think of that as simple as you might have test and prod. Um, in our case, you know, we, we've broken prod up and are leaning in more and more to splitting prod into much more uh, granular chunks of risk. So the advantage here of using these, this account sort of construct is you get to bucket your risk and, and create more least privilege, more compartmentalization. The downside is there's a little bit more management overhead in that. But we've built some tooling, and Amazon is working quickly on, on organizations and things like that to help you manage across multiple accounts. Um, so one of those basic management functions is to be able to push IAM roles across it. So here you'll see 
for our purposes, um, we'll talk about the, the S3 prefixes that we use and a couple of the IM roles. So we have a forensics account, and that again sort of buckets the risk of, of the forensics roles that have quite a bit of privilege. Uh, and that forensic account is home to an S3 bucket with two prefixes, evidence and trusted, as well as an IRS3 role that can write into evidence and read from trusted. So there's also some stuff in the back end there from evidence where as soon as a file hits that, we make a copy into a vault. So that basically gives us a, like a one-way data diode. So the S3, IRS3 role can write evidence and then it can't change it. So that's how we collect evidence in that S3 bucket. The trusted bucket we use to stage uh, trusted executables, configuration files, things that we need to trust during our response activities. Then you'll see in each of the target accounts, we have an IR role. So this is a fairly privileged role. It can do things like snapshot, run SSM commands, um, conduct whatever sort of uh, data gathering that we need. And that role can only be assumed into by roles in the forensic account. So that's how we maintain control, we maintain control of that role. It's a fairly privileged role, but you can only assume into it out of the forensic account, out of the automation tooling that we have in there. So based on that setup, what can we do with it? Well, first off, let's talk dead box forensics. So in the good old days, right, if you wanted to do some dead box forensics, you would run down to the data center, you'd pull a drive out of a server, hook it up to a write blocker in your lab, maybe wait overnight for that to make a byte by byte copy, and the next day you'd, you'd plug your fresh image into a big uh, workstation and you'd grind through to try and extract um, forensic information. So the goal there is, again, to, to collect relevant information off of that drive that might tell you what the adversaries were up to, what went wrong. Um, fortunately, in AWS, there's no more write blockers, there's no more running the data centers. You make an API call and the snapshot is taken for you. Um, and this is critical because in, in the Amazon environment at Netflix's scale, you're not making onesie twosie copies of drives. You want to copy 10, 50, 600, you know, thousands of drives at the same time. And the APL call lets you do that because it's not blocking, it's not happening in parallel, you're not waiting for the right blocker to complete. You just start making calls and it will tell you when it makes these snapshots are complete. So we built some automation around that to, to scale up that process. You can do it by the, via the console, but um, we've, we've elected to lean into a lambdas. So we have a snapshot lambda in our forensic account, and you can access that either through some sort of authentication from a user, or this could be kicked off automatically from an event. You might get an alert, one to one rich. Uh, but either way, it hits this lambda. This lambda has the proper IAM credentials to assume into the IR role in the target account. So there's a little bit of, of enrichment, a little bit of multi-account magic that happens first. You need to figure out where that instance is that you're targeting. So you can either pass uh, an ARN, an Amazon resource number that has sort of a fully qualified location of that instance, which includes the account in the region. Or we have some stuff that uses our, our backend tooling to look that up for you if you only have a partial bit of information. So it finds that instance. It finds the instance's root volume. You could also snapshot secondary volumes if you wanted. Uh, and then it provides that to the snapshot API and says, go ahead and make me a copy of this. So as I said, the snapshot API then immediately returns, all right, I'm making a copy, here's what it will be, uh, and it's in a sort of a pending state while that's made. And you can go ahead and add um, essentially metadata to that. So what we do is we, we share that snapshot with our forensics account, because the snapshot's been made from the context of the role within the target account, so it only is accessible within that target. So then we share it back with forensics, and that's how we sort of bring it home. Right? You don't have to SCP it across anything, you don't have to transfer any data, you just share the account and then it will pop up in there. So once we have that created and shared, um, you know, sort of then what? So then we need to process. Uh, and this is where it's a little bit more hairy. So using CloudWatch and the exact manner in which we've set up our forensic account, which uh, Will Benston talked about earlier this week, we get a, a stream of the CloudWatch and CloudTrail events in the forensic account. So we can see that the snapshot's been created, we can tell when it's been completed, and we have access to it. So essentially what that does is it kicks off another Lambda function called snap process. And unfortunately, lambdas are unable to mount volumes, or so they can't handle snapshots directly. So what we do is we launch from an AMI, um, a new instance, and during that EC2 launch process, we tell it to go ahead and mount that snapshot of the secondary drive. So when the machine comes up, it's got access to the target drive, um, it's got a set of tools on it from the AMI, and um, we can send it some commands via user data that tells it sort of state on what case this is for, what actions we want it to take, things like that. So then that starts grinding through, uh, extracting artifacts, and um, we do that using a, a Python script that we wrote um, that essentially leverages, um, Google has a product called GUR, uh, Google Rapid Response, and they wrote a set of YAML definitions for relevant forensic files. So we ingest that YAML file, we go and pick up those files, we move them into S3, and we tag them with some metadata. So at the end of the process, the instance tears itself down, and you're left with uh, files in S3. So we'll, we'll demo this at the end. 
So another option, if you didn't want to do dead box forensics, if you want to do live response, uh, is, is potentially faster, I, I would say, um, you know, it's, it's certainly noisier. So the trade-offs essentially are, with dead box forensics, you're only hitting the Amazon API layer. If the, if the attacker, the adversary is on the box, they can't see any of that, so it's fairly stealthy. Uh, in this case, you're gonna go live on the box. The advantage that gives you is it gives you access to system state. Uh, you, if you don't wanna take a full snapshot, you can pick individual files you might wanna grab. So it's potentially more surgical. So in this case, similar, similar model, right? You have either an analyst with a hunch or you have an automated event. It's gonna fire off this collection lambda. The lambda has the privilege to assume into the target account role. And in this case, it's gonna leverage something called Simple Server Manager, SSM. So SSM is a, a very powerful tool. Uh, if you have the SSM agents running on uh, your instances, then Amazon will provide all of the backhaul, all of the tasking, all of the multiplexing, and all of the sort of status reporting back. Uh, to basically run arbitrary commands. So as a live response tool, it's great. Um, some of the things that we've done to, to lock that down, that powerful tool, is you can use an SSM document that will define exactly what that SSM agent is allowed to do. So we've defined the document for our purposes that essentially says you're gonna go to the trusted bucket, you're gonna pull an archive, a zip file, you're gonna unzip it, you're gonna run an entry point script, and then from there, you know, we can do whatever we need to do. Uh, generally what we do is then rotate files into S3, uh, or we can sometimes, we'll run OS query, because that will give us uh, information on system state. So you can run OS query, dump results into S3, dump results in Elasticsearch, something like that. Um, one note on the IRS3 role. So initially, the way that we approached this was to allow any instance to assume into the IRS3 role. Uh, and the reason, one of the, the other reasons we have the IRS3 rule is because when you copy, a, when you write a file into S3, it's helpful to do that from a role within the same account because uh, it matches up some of the identifiers. But if we allow every instance to assume into that role, then we have to give every instance in our environment the assume role privilege. And that was a, a fairly powerful privilege we didn't really want to give to everybody. So instead what we do is we have that lambda function there, the collect lambda, do the assume role, uh, then hit STS for temporary credentials, and we pass those credentials as a parameter to the SSM document. So, you know, arguably that's a bit of an anti-pattern, passing credentials as parameters, but because they're temporary and because of the limited things that the IRS3 rule can do, we felt that was better than imbuing all of our instances on the edge with a SUM rule. So that's how we handle it for now. Um, you know, we're, we're still, still exploring that. So, yeah, the SSM rule that can then assume into the IRS3 rule and have access to the buckets that it needs to have access to. But at the end of the day, you still end up with essentially files in S3. So what then? So then the next stage is processing. And this is, this is great because, you know, whether it's the snapshot or the live response, um, either way, you're getting files dropped into S3 in a non-blocking manner. So you don't have to wait to complete one instance to move to the next. You can do all these things in parallel. Similarly, as soon as files hit S3, uh, as soon as evidence files hit S3, these artifacts, a CloudWatch, or an S3 event, rather, is, is generated, and it can trigger a Lambda. So then we trigger a dispatch Lambda. Dispatch um, basically looks at the new object, the new object that's just landed in S3. It looks at its metadata, it looks at its prefix, and it has logic in it that can then pick which parser to send that object to. So the simplest way to do it is you just, you tag in the metadata, you know, parser with the name. Dispatch will look at what, what lambdas it has available, and it will go ahead and invoke. So say it's a syslog file, right? We have a syslog file, hits evidence. Dispatch says, oh, okay, I see this is tagged as a syslog file. I have a syslog parser in my Lambda uh, inventory, so I'm going to invoke that, pass it the object, and then that, that Lambda will spin up, bring the file into memory, process out all the events. In our case, we process them out into, into JSON because we use a, another Google product called uh, Time Sketch. So it'll process out all the relevant events, put them into in Elasticsearch, and then your analyst can come in and, and timeline that with Time Sketch or you know, look at it as a graph in Time Sketch. So, uh, these parsers, I think, are, are a very powerful concept, and it's an area that we're definitely looking to collaborate on. I think you know, individuals could write parsers for any number of things, any sort of evidence you could think about collecting. So you know, it could be syslog, it could be other log file formats, it could be configuration files, it could be executables. Right? You could have a lambda that then sends your executable to virus total or um, sends it to a detonation service or spins up an instance to do some more investigation of what that is. Uh, sort of the sky's the limit on what these parsers could do. So we're working to take some of the work that's gone into Plazo and, and log to timeline, which is an existing forensics tool, and sort of repurpose that in a Lambda environment. 
because again, the, the advantage this gives us is total scalability. You can run as many of these in parallel as, as your Amazon account will allow, essentially. So you can process large amounts of, of data much more quickly. So if there's interest there, I, I'd love to hear from folks, again, looking to, to collaborate. And you know, not everyone needs to write the same syslog parser over and over again. We could probably do this once as a community and, um, and have some sort of open source solution around that. So yeah, at the end of the day, this, this gets us into Elasticsearch and, uh, and into a, an area where the, the analysts can take a look at it. So that's the talk, and now we can run through a quick demo to show some of that. HDMI one. Armando, could I get your password? <laughs> just, just shout it out. Here I come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One, two, three, no? Yeah, not far off. <laughs> Thanks. So, well, let's see if Wi Fi is up. Oops. This is a uh, video demo. I didn't have the stones to do this live. So, um, <laughs> so in this demo, we're, we're actually on an instance in the forensics account. We're not using the Lambda function. The, the great thing about, or the terrible thing about automation is that it's really boring to watch because uh, it just sort of happens. But um, these are some of the scripts that um, we wrote early on to, to sort of prove this out. So here's the, the snapshot script. Um, and this might be too small. But uh, it's basically you know, telling you the, the various things you can do. You define a case, you define the instances, um, and then it goes ahead and conducts a snapshot. So we're gonna, we pick an instance. This screen here is, is Spinnaker. It's one of the things we use to manage our accounts. So we're picking this instance ID uh, in the test account. We're gonna go ahead and, and snapshot that. Uh, so I'm showing you here that there are no snapshots in the management account. You'll notice this is, uh, in the upper right there, this is not the test account. This is the management test account. So you'll see magically that these, these um, Snapshots will appear. And this is showing that you gotta be in the same, the same region. So here we go, we're not getting the help file this time. We're gonna define, this is case triple zero, quad, quad zero. And you can give it a list of instances. Um, you can actually give it a list of, of sort of any number of identifiers and it will resolve those into, into root volumes for you. Uh, so again, not super interesting, but basically you can see it uh, taking those, those um, parameters and then going and making a few BOTO calls to, uh, to do, do the, the needly. And so this is the net result. It's found this is the root volume of that instance and it's submitted it for a snapshot. And we'll pivot back over to here. And then we reload, there's the snapshot. So snapshot for the case number by Dexter is what we call the, the program, um, has now appeared in the management account. So now we'll walk through manually what that Lambda function uh, does with EC2 launch. So basically back onto the same um, forensics instance running in, in that account, uh, showing you that there's two drives mounted right now. So there's the, the root drive and a, and a secondary. Gonna take this instance ID, pop back over into console, find that, you see it's the cert ops box. So it's important to make note of the availability zone because it's not just region, it's actually availability zone where these uh, snapshots or where the volume will be created. So we create it in the same zone as our, our instance. Of course, you know, with the Lambda, it's sort of the flip, you create the, you launch the Lambda in whatever zone you need it to, to be in. And so, boom, volume's created. So now we're gonna mount that volume to this instance. So we go to the volume, we find this volume we just created. And we attach it. So it's gonna mount up on the F mount 
happens pretty quick. You can see it. It's already in use. This is the state. So over here, we'll do the, the F disk again. You can see now we've got this new drive. This is our target drive. And we're going to run the collection script. So one of the things that we're working on going forward is more of that differential analysis that I talked about. So in that case, rather than, um, rather than just mounting this drive and doing uh, the collect Python, we would go and find the base AMI snapshot. So a, a, an AMI is basically a snapshot wrapped in some metadata. So if you find the AMI snapshot uh, and you compare it to this target snapshot, that's where you get that differential analysis. So we could, in theory, mount both of those up um, and do essentially a hash deep across the, the known good and then do hash deep in audit mode. So here you see we mounted it, uh, listed out the file, and you can see this looks roughly like a, a root directory of a, of a Unix box, that's what it is. So it's mounted up. Now we're going to demo the, the collection script. So the collection script operates in two different modes. Uh, we're going to run it in target. So you can either run it as a live response script, you can run it on a target, in which case you define the case number uh, and it rips out the artifacts from itself. Otherwise, you can target a specific directory and it creates that as if it's the root directory. So that's what we're doing here. Run in target mode, uh, case number again. And then uh, you could define additional things, well, you, the amount point, and then you could define which artifacts wanted only do a subset. You could define you know, verbosity. So this is in sort of quiet mode because otherwise it shows a bunch of my account numbers that I didn't want to share. So. But you can get an idea of time from now. So you see some errors here where it's, uh, it's skipping various things. Some of the YAML artifacts aren't actually files, so it, it errors out on those. Um, but it's sort of it's copying things in S3 in the background. It's threaded, so it's doing this in parallel, so it runs through pretty quick. Some interesting um, nuances around how snapshots work, so the, the, the first time you sort of traverse them, uh, they get moved into a hotter cache, so you get much better performance the second time you run things, which doesn't really help particularly with, uh, with forensics, but um, you know, depending on the various states behind the scenes, you can, uh, you can improve performance with some tweaks. So here you'll see, this again is a, a screenshot because I had to obfuscate some things, but so we've taken a I think it was a 10 or a 20 gigabyte snapshot, and we've got it down to about three megs worth of files, 501 total objects. So that's a pretty good reduction, right? If, if you believe that these files are the relevant forensic artifacts, then you've just knocked that down to a much more manageable set of things to look through. So yeah, overall, that's, um, that's the stuff that we're working on. Um, as I said, investing more in better parsers, investing more in, um, in differential analysis to try and pop out that adversary activity from our from our, our fleet. So Armando, I don't know if you had anything else or we could take some questions if folks want to jump on the mic. Yeah. Hello? You're back to one. Yep, that's much better. <laughs> so the only thing, a couple of things that I wanted to, to, to share with you very briefly. The first one is um, I skipped through it very quickly, but um, the whole code for the CloudWatch events orchestration together with Lambda, and essentially the whole thing that I demoed to you, uh, it's, uh, it's open sourced essentially. So it's under the AWS labs in that repo, automated governance sample. So if you guys test it, have questions, Evolve it. There's a lot to improve. You know, do do reach out. Uh, and lastly, lastly, just a few more cameras. Uh, lastly, you know, more than demos and talking about it. I know that uh, you know both great ways of sharing information and uh, demos even better. But even better than all of that is when you do things by yourself. You, know, you get first-hand experience. So as Alex mentioned, we are running at the park the, the security jam and the jam lounge. Uh, that is an opportunity for you to try a number of security use cases. We also have some special challenges with Netflix. You get some sweet swag with that. <laughs> uh, we also have Mozilla as well. And a couple other interesting ones is last night we announced a new security product called Guard Duty. 
So that could be your first opportunity to experiment with guard duty as well. We provide all the accounts and infrastructure, but you do need to bring a laptop. That's the only thing we don't have, right? With all that being said, big thanks to Alex. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for your time. We'll be around if you have any questions. Thanks so much.